Hello everyone, it's Thursday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. Tomorrow, September 15th, marks International Day of Democracy, providing a chance to review the state of democracy around the world. Democracy is deeply related to freedom of opinion and expression. And according to the Freedom House report, South Korea scored the same as the U.S. in the freedom status category. Though the figure says that freedom has somewhat been secured in Korean society, there are still several aspects that are threatening democracy, such as political polarization and fake news, among others. What are the core elements of democracy and what history has Seoul gone through to achieve it? And to enhance democracy, what should be done? For more on this, we invite attorney An Jun Sung into the studio. Welcome, Mr. An. Oh, thank you. And we also have a Korean studies professor Mark Peterson uh, from Brigham Young University. Good to see you, Professor Peterson. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. Now, uh, first question to our Mr. An. Uh, like I said before, September 15th celebrates the International Day of Democracy. Uh, before we delve into the specifics, what are the main elements that are needed for a country to be considered as democratic? Okay, well, let's begin with the definition. The term democracy originated from the ancient Greek word that basically means that people rule. Mm -hmm. So democracy means there is a type of government system uh, in which you know, state power is vested in the people. The people means the general population, right? So in this regard, the United Nations also defined the term as that the government system which uh, you know, respect or protect the human rights and fundamental freedoms, such as freedom of speech. So well, it, put it together, I just call, call an answering to your question, three elements perhaps is so people power and then human rights mm -hmm. and then fundamental protection. I think that's three elements for the democracy. Mm, right, I see. Now, uh, Professor Peterson, according to the annual Freedom House report titled Freedom in the World 2023, South Korea scored 83 points in the index, the same as the United States in the global freedom status category. Um, how do you see the figure? And there were certainly other countries that scored higher than the U.S. and South Korea. What made them be so? Well, the uh, Freedom House categories, they have a four-point scale in numerous categories, and you add them all up and you get the total that they come up with. Uh, and Korea got three out of four in many categories and four out of four in many categories. I don't think there was a two out of four on any of the Korean scale. Uh, the Korean scale of 83 has been consistent for the last 10 years or so, 83, 84. The United States has declined. They were 89 about 10 years ago, and they've dropped down to 83 at this point. But it's interesting that some other countries are at 99 and 100. Uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Norway, and Finland are all 100. Uh, Canada is 98. Uh, New Zealand is 99. So it shows that both the United States and uh, Korea have a ways to go to get to that uh, higher score into the 90s. Mm, right, I see. There are still ways to go uh, to, uh, you know, reach that point. Now, uh, Mr. An, South Korea, you know, had to go through harsh history to gain freedom and to achieve this current level of democracy. Could you briefly tell us uh, the major events South Korea had to go through? Well, yes, it's a kind of long history, right? Mm -hmm. So, but, well, then, let me start it right. The Korean history, I mean, the first, we have now six Republican, Republic in this government system means that we have a, a 1948, we have a constitution, and then we have a fifth uh, amendment to the constitution. So first time was 1948, was, you know. But however, what happened was big, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a change in Korean history is that the, whoever in the president, they want to keep the power for longer or forever, there was always something bad happened, mm -hmm. right? That happens, the president, uh, Lee Seung-man, well, he would have to step down because, the, you know, the April revolution. Also, the pre uh, president, Park jong hee mm -hmm. and he tried to get, you know, the up to Yushin constitution, and he got assassinated by the chief of Korean CIA. Mm. So, so whoever tried to keep the power forever, that's the really bad sign. And then some people tried to do it, and it was bad, you know, some lesson we get it from the history. And then the the first thing that happened was the 19, you know, 1972, that's Yushin constitution really, you know, the, you know, going backward to the to democratic system. And then now we have one, then, you know, the, the Teo had a, the president Teo before, before he elected, he promised had the, uh, you know, June 29th declaration. Basically, mm -hmm. he promised to have the direct presidential election after the you know you know military you know 
authoritarian government for 19 years, something so. So that was a big uh, change, a uh, milestone for the Korean uh, democratic history mm -hmm. that we have a direct presidential election uh, from then since on. And then there's a, you know, president comes up and then it, Kim Young Chum it was kind of first civilian prison after a long time of the military, you know, you know, I say, since they dictate some dictatorship, right? So they got authoritarian government. So mm -hmm. there was a big shift, and now we have six, um, you know, the Republican government. So we now we're still talking about some new amendment to the Constitution. There's many issues, and then we know that not, since 1948, it's been a long time. The t society changes, so maybe the time for perhaps the time for change. Talking about the new amendment to the Constitution, perhaps we have a looking at the seventh. Republic in the you know, near future. Right? Mm, right, I see. There were several uh, bumps that we had to go mm -hmm. through to gain this level of democracy. Now, uh, Professor Peterson, as a professor who has been studying Korean uh, studies for many years, what do you believe was the key that enabled South Koreans to achieve this uh, democracy? And how do foreign researchers see South Korea's history? Well, most foreign researchers, in fact, most domestic researchers, look at Korean history in light of the last uh, century or less. Uh, I'm a specialist in the Chosun dynasty, and I look at the deeper roots where Korean culture as a whole was open to democratic ideas. For example, uh, in Korea, uh, the king in the old days had to listen to his advisors uh, who would criticize him. And he was required to listen to this criticism. In fact, there were three agencies of government that um, had the duty of criticizing the king. It was like the inspector general. And they'd criticize the king, they'd criticize the government, and uh, they would offer uh, correction to the king. Mm. And the king had to listen to, to those criticisms. And if the king did not, like there was one king, Yen Sangun, who got tired of the criticism, and so he fired a bunch of uh, his advisors and killed a bunch of them. And then he did it a second time, and then he did it a third time, at which point the uh, government rose up and uh, deposed the king. Now, that's an incredibly important thing because in modern democracy, we would call that impeachment. Mm. And indeed, Yen Sangun and later Kwang Hae Gun, two kings, were deposed in that in that manner, which shows that Korea had a a, a tendency uh, toward uh, democracy. Uh, there's one other area of uh, dem democracy we see deep in Korean history, and that is student protests. Mm. We know that the students brought down the Syngman Rhee government and were instrumental in changing the Park Chung-hee government. And eventually the 1987 uh, criticism of uh, Chen du hwan that brought in full democracy, full freedom of the press in 1987. And these student demonstrations have a deep roots in Korea because the uh, Sungyungwan was the original university in Korea, older than Seoul National University. Uh, the Sungyungwan uh, had some of the best students who would take the exams to qualify for government positions. And the Sung Yung Guan students, if they didn't like something the king did, they would walk out. They would demonstrate. Mm. And so the idea of student demonstrations has deep roots in Korea, which is a form of democratic uh, action. So Korea has deep roots uh, and a tendency toward uh, democracy that uh, other East Asian countries did not have. Mm, right, I see. It's so interesting to uh, find out that there were roots of democracy even from the Joseon dynasty. Now, uh, Professor Peterson, one more question. So there is no doubt that South Korea achieved a certain level of democracy through, uh, by going through, you know, student protests, like you said. But some elements are threatening it right now, and one of them is serious political polarization. Uh, first of all, how polarized is South Korea's politics right now compared to other countries? and what are its own characteristics? Well, polarization is a serious, serious issue in Korea. In fact, at uh, uh, liberation, uh, when Korea was liberated from uh, the Japanese stranglehold, uh, from that time forth, Korea was extremely polarized, which led to the Korean War. So in comparison with that, uh, Korea, South Korea today is not as polarized, but these polarized elements are still quite strong. Mm. And 
it's not a good example from the United States because the United States is very strongly polarized right now. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, former President Trump is under criminal investigation. And um, in a way, Korea uh, has set an example for Korea because, uh, excuse me, Korea has set an example for the United States because uh, Korea has been successful in impeaching a president. Uh, we talk about democracy, the highest point of democracy is the voting uh, booth, the ballot. But in another sense, the highest form of democracy is impeachment. Mm. Because once a president is uh, in place, that president has great power and it's hard to remove that president. But Korea has done that successfully. Mm. The United States has not. So in a sense, Korea is more democratic in some ways than, uh, than the United States is. Uh, in fact, as far as democracy is concerned, from 1987 onward, the uh, Korean universities elected their president from among the faculty. And American universities do not do that. American universities, every single one, is, uh, uh, selects the president by the board of trustees, whether it's a state school or a private school or a church school, there's a board of trustees. In Korea, uh, uh, democracy was so successful. Now, I understand some universities have rolled back that idea, uh, but still, many universities still elect a president. So in many regards, Korea has more democratic institutions, more democratic examples mm. than the United States, although the Freedom House rates them both at uh, 83 points at the current, uh, the current uh, level. Mm, I see your point. Now, uh, Mr. Ahn, our uh, Professor Peterson told us about the unique characteristics of Korean politics. Now I'd like to ask you, how is such political polarization closely linked to the degradation of democracy? Well, I think that just what uh, Professor Pierce talked about, the Joseon dynasty, right? If you go back to Joseon dynasty, also we had a polarization, mm -hmm. right? It's 500 years year history, but always polarized, right? There's the really end of it, really bad thing happened, you know, you know, Japanese invasion or something, a lot of things happens. I think that my concern, personal concern is that the Korea is now, it's just, you know, politics really polarized, but I, I understand that the democratic system itself by itself by definition you kind of guaranteed uh, freedom of speech mm -hmm. kind of you know their opinions you can talk whatever you want to say you can believe whatever you want to believe it mm -hmm. but problem was that about the trust issue right can we trust the other uh, no matter what difference we have between the part between you and me basically so my concern is about the misinformation and disinformation mm -hmm. these days so what happened in the US what, what the former president US president like Donald Trump talk about you know fake news now fake news is common term in Korea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you see, everything is everything you don't like it. You, you want to say that's the fake news, but mm -hmm. that's not correct actually. Mm -hmm. But we'll say define the mis you know, information and disinformation. Disinformation means that you intend to f defraud or mm -hmm. fraud something. They have to say something bad have happened. Misinformation, perhaps you know. You're talking about something that there's possibility is quite be incorrect information. Mm. So, but the concern is that there's a it's sometimes an ambiguous of the distinction between misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. But my understanding about the democratic system is that no matter what, whether it's a disinformation, misinformation, we have to listen whatever the other people say, mm. and they would decide by ourselves. But you don't just criticize because of you have different position. Mm. I think that's concern. Korea now, we probably talking different story. They criticize. Mm. They don't care whether it's right misinformation or disinformation or even correct information, right? Mm. That's really bad thing. I think the idea about the public system, a public de democratic system is mm -hmm. that open this discussion, we mm -hmm. talk whatever you believe is right, mm -hmm. and we discuss and uh, discussion over, and we agree, try to agree on some issues. I think that's the idea about democratic system, mm. right? Right, I see, I agree that that is a very uh, much concerning point. Uh, now, Professor Peterson, we are going to talk about uh, the fake news, the, the risk that fake news poses, but before that, uh, some say artificial intelligence algorithms that are deeply rooted in our daily lives and choices could make polarization worse. Um, how so and how should this be tackled? Uh, yes, that's a serious problem. Uh, in uh, American society, we talk about this polarization in terms of a farm metaphor. We use the word silo. Mm. A silo uh, you don't see many in Korea, but at some farms you see these these tall, tall uh, buildings uh, that store grain for the cattle. And a silo is a tall building that only has one thing in it, you know, corn or 
wheat or whatever it is. And we talk about information silos today where uh, right-wingers uh, are in their silo, left-wingers are in their silo, and they don't listen much to what's going on in the other, in the other silo. And our news system, both in Korea and the United States these days, is like that. In the old days, we like to talk about the old days, uh, there was a single news source and there was a certain degree of unanimity about uh, ideas, political ideas, and what was going on. But uh, these days, uh, people that listen to one source don't listen to the other source, mm. and they have these polarized ideas of what's going on in society. So these uh, social media algorithms with everybody listening to their own preferred source, uh, further deepens the uh, polarization. Mm. And as we've been talking about, this is a grave issue and a grave threat to uh, democracy. Democracy, as uh, Professor Ahn mentioned at the beginning, is uh, ruled by the people. Well, if the people have no unanimity, mm. what kind of rule is that going to be? So that's a, that's a serious problem. And I don't know, I don't have any idea what the answer would be. It, it doesn't look very, uh, promising for the future, frankly. Mm, right, I see. I agree to your point. It's very concerning indeed. Uh, now, Mr. Ahn, shifting gears a little bit to the fake news. So, even President Yoon suk yeol has many times underscored that fabrications or fake news could threaten the country's freedom. How should this be dealt with? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, the fake news is that I guess that the term is kind of uh, become popular because the, the former U.S. President you know, Trump, right, say fake news every time. So we have mm -hmm. to, oh, it's a fake news. But uh, I think that depends on how you see it. You know, when, if someone say you say you talk about it's a fake news, that can you prove it? The problem is that can you prove it or disprove it? In many cases, it's, it's a neither case mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's sometimes hard to prove it or disprove it, whatever is right or wrong. And then it, it, given that fact, I think that we shouldn't use the term fake news to some other people because that some part maybe it's not 100% correct information mm -hmm. and it's not 100% incorrect information. Sometimes, in most cases, it's, uh, it's a mingling of facts, true fact and untrue fact, sometimes fabrications possibly. So what we're trying to do is that we, I think we should do, try to carefully listen whatever, all whatever that people say and then carefully make, de make decision, you know, reasonable decision, you know, rational decision, how, you know, how far is right, which one is right or wrong. Even, the, even one statement, you can find that there's something possibly wrong or incorrect information together, mingled mm -hmm. together the fact. So, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't use that, you know, carefully use the term fake news, anything is a misrepresentation, mm -hmm. uh, because that there's a partial wrong and partial right, always, mm -hmm. in mo most cases. So, we should say, try to focus on what is right, and we try to point out, I, I don't think I disagree on the, the part which possibly wrong or misreading something. That's, the, I think, how we talk to other people, not only politi political leaders, or, you know, you know, general, you know, you know, general, you know, I say general, you know, population, we talk talking daily, you know, daily lives, right? Mm, right, I see. Now, uh, Professor Peterson, uh, another important element of democracy is press freedom. And according to the World Press Freedom Index by Reporters Without Borders, South Korea ranked 47th, falling four places from last year. Why do you believe the journalism environment in Korea has been downgraded? Well, journalism is, of course, one of the key elements of freedom. And uh, if you don't have a free press, you're going to have some limitations on your freedom. And uh, Korea lost points recently because uh, President Yoon has uh, uh, introduced some criticisms of the freedom uh, of the press uh, that gave Korea a lower uh, index point. Uh, overall, though, uh, Korea, you know, is fairly healthy at 83 points. That includes the press points that uh, dropped. Uh, I think they dropped from uh, 50 to 47 or 51 to 47. So, uh, yeah, it's it's an issue. Uh, uh, the freedom of the press is also part of the problem because of the fake news issue, because freedom of the press allows, well, in one phrase in English, we call it yellow journalism, which is sensational journalism, which is journalism that's uh, um, uh, telling uh, stories to to sell newspapers, to sell airtime, and uh, some uh, less than credible news agencies will tell 
sensational stories because uh, they get more viewers and more mm. followers that way. So uh, this freedom of the press issue is really a serious issue, and President Yoon is trying to uh, uh, trying to do a good thing by making the press more responsible. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, he's put some limitations on the press, which lowers its points. So it's a tricky business uh, mm -hmm. to to raise your points to be a true freedom, uh, a true free country. But you know, some countries are doing it. All of Scandinavia gets 100 points. New Zealand gets 99. Mm -hmm. Japan is 96. Uh, Taiwan is 94, so there's ways to increase our, our, our standing, both in America and in South Korea, I would think. Mm, I see your point. Uh, Professor Peterson, we are running out of time, but I'd like to ask you this question. Um, what are other factors that pose risks for South Korea's democracy? And in order for South Korea to be more democratic and free, what measures should be done? Well, uh, South Korea is in a difficult situation because mm. when we say, you know, usually when I talk about Korea, I just say Korea. To me, that means South Korea. But let's say South mm -hmm. because that implies the North, <laughs> which implies a, a continual threat to South Korea, which is uh, uh, one of the issues in uh, democratic movement. Uh, Korea has to be a little bit careful. And I've, I've been in and out of Korea for the last 57, 58 years. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, the military governments. I've seen more liberal governments. And uh, the threat of military takeover is always there. Uh, but fortunately, Korea has uh, cast off the military government and it has a true uh, democracy. And uh, people criticize uh, one government as being left wing and one government being right wing, but it's been very healthy the way the Korean government has moved back and forth from one camp to the other in the last several years. So uh, I mentioned I'm a little bit pessimistic about how to handle the uh, news element. But on the other hand, you look at what's going on with Korea, they have a healthy, prosperous, mm. thriving democracy. I'm using all the good words because Korea has a, a wonderful democratic tradition that's been hard to establish, mm. but it's there now. And, and Korea should be congratulated on how well it's doing in the democratic uh, field, I think. All right, I see, Professor Peterson. It's good to hear that. Well, uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. But uh, thank you, Professor Peterson, for your time and insights. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Ahn, for thank your time and insights as well. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.